All right, here we go. Parshas Shmos, or Shmot, Parshat Shmot. First Torah portion of the second book of the Torah. It's a lot going on here. We'll try to get through it quickly. If not, you can always speed it up as you listen to it. Even though a lot of this should be pretty familiar because we are now going into the whole story of the Exodus. So this week's Torah portion begins with the phrase, These are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. And it goes through and recounts the, name, the names of the tribes, all them um, who were there, showing that part of what we're showing here is that the Jewish people held on to the identity. Um, we say that three things the Jewish people held on to, their names, their clothing, and their language. And these, these are all part of the merit that they had to be worthy of redemption because they kind of slipped and kind of went off away in, some, in a lot of other things. They, they sank into the, into the depravity of Egypt. Anyways, it also wants to show us that they started off as 70, right? But so we said they were exactly 70 when they came down. And now the, there's going to be a massive population boom that's going to occur. Now at this point, where we're starting right now, all the Shvat and the 12 tribes all pass away. The one who lived the longest was Levi. Levi lived to 137. And and he passed away. And now, you know, now the story is about to start. The story of the Exodus is gonna start. So um at this point now, the, the Jewish women, they're starting to have a lot, a lot of kids. Uh, at, at least or about six children can be born at one time. So obviously the population, massive boom is occurring. Now at that time it says, the, the Torah portion says that a new king arose who didn't know Yosef. Okay, like he, now there's two explanations. So I mean, he didn't know Yosef. So either it could be the same king that rose up, the same Pharaoh who now that, you know, everybody else had died off, all the Jacobsons, the original Jacobsons were gone. It's like, oh, who are these people anyways? You know, okay, we're gonna have a new program now. Or it was actually a new king who, because he had no association with any of these, he pretended like, you know, no, nah, nothing to see here kind of thing. Now, he sees what's going on with this massive population boom and he starts scaremongering. Like, oh, these Jewish people, they're going to become so many, they're going to overthrow us and, you know, all these terrible things that are going to occur. Even though there was, there was no indication that, that any of that was going to happen. He decided. Okay, so he said, we're, what we're going to do, we're going to outsmart them. Okay. Now, commentators say that he had three advisors, and who are the three advisors? You might recognize some of these names. Bilam, Bilam, who we see later with the whole story of the donkey and cursing the Jewish people. Much later, it's going to come up. Um, Yeser, who was actually Yisro, Yisro, Moshe's future father-in-law, and someone by the name of Eel, who's Job. You know, like the book of Job. So they said these three were his advisors, and Bilam said, "Okay, we have to have this, this system of oppression." that's eventually gonna lead to a decrease in the birth rate, right? If we beat them down so much, they're not gonna, not gonna wanna keep having kids. They're not gonna have the energy to have kids anymore and it'll be done. Yisro disagreed and he, he got out of there and then Eve remained silent. Now, what we do see that Bilaam's plan is kind of what they use because power, what he does, by the way, side, side note, the name, the, the fact that we call Egyptian kings pharaohs is specifically because of the Torah, because Pharaoh was means like the great house in e, in Egypt in in Egyptian, and but they used to call their kings king, and we call them pharaohs because the Torah made it a popular use to call the Egyptian king Pharaoh. So fun fact. Okay, anyways, so they're gonna decide they're gonna use Bill's plan. So Pharaoh shows up to work one day, and he's got you know he's got the tools ready. He's like, come everyone, we're gonna go, we're gonna go to work. And he gathered all the Jewish people, all the Jewish men, he gathered them all together. And the only people who didn't show up were the tribe, were the Levites, the tribe of Levi. Levi, they did not show up. They said, no, we, you know, our job is to study. We're the, we're the future priests of the people. Um, we got to be, you know, the scholars and all that kind of stuff. It's not, it's not our job to, to work. And Pharaoh actually left them alone. He left them to be the, the scholars and the whatever. He didn't, first of all, it wasn't exactly Judaism. I'm like, okay, fine. He didn't, him and his thing with God is one thing, but it wasn't that he was, out and I like Judaism. He just wanted to keep the, the Jewish population beaten down and in check. Okay, that's a, you know, that's one way of seeing it. But um, he, he left the, the Levites alone. He didn't he didn't mess with them. Um, so everybody else came and they're all like, oh, we're all going to help Pharaoh with the work now. And for say, you know, it's a big community uh, project that they're all helping with the work. But then the day's over and they're like, oh, how many bricks did you build? How many bricks did you build? Great. Now you have to do that same again for me tomorrow. So this is kind of like the first phase almost of the slavery, which lasted for about 30 years, this first phase of kind of forcing them into indentured servitude, right? Oh, now that you work here, now you, you don't get to, now you don't get to leave now. 
So kind of tricking them into working. And what they what they built, what the Jewish people built, were the two storage cities of, of it's Pisum and Ramses. So Pitom and uh, I don't know what the English is. Anyways, so they did that, but the plan didn't work because the Jewish population kept increasing. So now they're like, great, <laughs> plan, this plan isn't working. We got to we gotta double down on this. So now we get into like the f- second phase, which only lasted for a short amount of time. Well, before things got worse, it's like, okay, now we're going to go to backbreaking, demoralizing um, labor. So part of it is that they try to, like they were giving men women's work and the women the men's work and they weren't keeping up. Right, they couldn't. The men, the women didn't have the strength to be doing what the men, what men usually do, and the men were not able to handle the woman's work. So it was just not happening. Now it was the Jewish woman, to the credit of the Jewish woman, who helped subvert this whole plan, and they kept you know the population rising, um, because they they had their little tricks that they did to to make sure that the Ferris plan would not succeed. Now during this time, this little five-year phase over here, this phase two phase, this is when Miriam and Aaron are born. Miriam and Aaron are born at this time. Now this time also, um, they it, they start going above, like the Egyptians started going beyond the original, um, uh, like the original plan for slavery because they knew going back to, to Avraham, there's the covenant between the parts that goes all the way back. That God told Avram, like, your children are going to be slaves in a land that's not theirs, etc., etc. So everybody knew kind of that this was going to happen. The problem is that the Egyptians, it's not just that they knew it was going to happen. Like, they took it very eagerly and they and they were a little bit of overachievers in it. Which also why it set up their their eventual punishment. Because if, if God says that the Jewish people are going to be slaves, you can't be mad at the Egyptians for making them slaves. It was kind of, you know, they fulfilled the prophecy kind of thing. But they took to, it wasn't just that like, oh, they brought them into the indentured servitude kind of thing. It's, it's when they went above that, you know, and there was not anyone in Egypt, not even the foreigners in Egypt, and not even the slaves in Egypt who weren't glad to see the Jewish people turn into slaves. So that led also to their eventual punishment in that, in that they took it too eagerly and they went like way beyond what they were supposed to. Now, so after, so this obviously isn't work, this didn't work either. The demoralizing backbreaking labor didn't work either, so now we have to have the third plan. What's the third plan? Is that Pharaoh now calls to the Jewish midwives, they said their names are Shifra and Pua, and commentators say this is Miriam and Yocheved. Um, Yocheved is the daughter of Levi, and she, who was born, actually she's number 70, who was born when they came um, into the land of Egypt. So she's actually over 100 at this point. And Miriam's her daughter, Baron, Miriam, Aaron, and soon Moshe. Moses is going to be her son. So he says, okay, new plan is that you guys are midwives, you're gonna, you have to kill all the baby boys that are born. Why? Because Pharaoh has just been told now by his astrologers that the, the Redeemer of Israel is going to be born, um, is about to be born. So he's like, great, we've got to take action now to make sure he's not, he doesn't survive, right? Now he says, kill the baby boys, but the girls you should let live. Well, it wasn't just that like, oh, don't kill the girls. It was like, we're going to let the girls live and we're going to inundate them and bring them into Egyptian culture. We're basically going to turn, make them into Egyptians. So it was a physical and spiritual destruction of the people that he now aimed for in this third phase now. Now, there's actually some, just some of the commentaries say that, you know, we have the physical destruction, we have the physical harm, and then the spiritual harm. It just goes to show that the spiritual harm comes second because it shows that it's worse. And we have, you know, we're in exile now. And through all the exiles we've been to, there's always been people have been like oh if you only immerse in our culture right if you only become more and more like us that's going to save you right that's that's what's going to redeem you or or see you out of this and we have to hold fast to our tradition and to, to our identity and to who we are to make sure that we don't also face this sort of uh, spiritual harm or destruction anyway so we call the midwives tell them the whole plan the midwives don't listen they're like oh the jewish people the jewish women are like animals they just give birth so quickly they don't even need us da 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 whatever um and so obviously, so God blessed them for this, and then obviously it didn't work to call the population because they kept, um, because nothing was being done, right? So Pharaoh now decides he has to plant Egyptian spies among the Jewish people to like find if someone's pregnant, right? And we'll keep track of this woman until the woman gives birth and we'll see what, you know, and they'll do what has to be done to the babies. Now, this time also you have, Yochebed was married to a man named Amram, Actually, uh, they say this is her nephew, which you could, this is one of the things that we do, this is before the Torah is born because 
an aunt is not a lot to marry her nephew, but for the turn of born, this was still kind of permissible. It wasn't not, it was not forbidden specifically. So anyways, he divorces Yochev. He says, what's the point of all this? We're just gonna keep having children. They're just gonna come, they're gonna kill him. Like we can't get around this anymore. And Miriam, who was probably like about seven or six, seven at the time, she says to her father, you've, 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 dec- you've decreed uh, death even on baby girls. You're not even letting baby girls be born by separating from Yochev, right? Because everyone's gonna follow what you've done. So it's her prophecy that actually gets her parents back together. And then eventually we have that on Zion Adar, which is on the seventh day of Adar, Moshe is born. And Pharaoh finds out that, you know, the, dream, the Redeemer is gonna, be, is gonna be, is born now. They also, he also found out the Redeemer's end is gonna be through water, which is why he starts with the next thing of throw all the baby boys into the Nile River, right? He wasn't, until then he wasn't doing that, but throw the baby boys into the Nile River and they didn't know if it was gonna be a Jewish boy or an Egyptian boy. So they threw all baby boys into the Nile River. Um, now the, re- the end that was gonna come through water was gonna be much later with the, with Moses and the, and the well and the rock and all that kind of stuff. It was be, obviously that that's what the end was gonna be about. So the astrologers kind of had a little bit of a hazy vision there and they did this massive um, throwing babies into the Nile River, Egyptians and Jews because of this. And so they also thought they knew, you know, this idea that God usually punishes what we call Mida connected Mida, which is measure for measure. That, so he says, God promised that he was never gonna flood the world again after after the flood, right? That was one of the parts, that's the whole rainbow in the sky sort of thing. So I'm gonna throw the baby boys into the river, God cannot punish me, right? There could be no punishment through water because God promised. But Pharaoh obviously mistook that because it wasn't that God didn't say, I can't punish you through water. God just said, I'm not gonna flood the entire world through water, which is part of why all the Egyptians drowned in the Yamsuf, which, okay, that comes later. So not skip ahead too much. Anyways. So what happened is that um, Moshe is born and Moshe is born actually after seven months. So he's born early. So Yocheved was able to hide him for about three months, right? Because you have all the Egyptian spies are trying to look out and you know, they're, they're keeping track of her, they're paying attention. Now they said that when he was born, the whole world was full of light. The, uh, the whole room, sorry, the whole room was filled with light. And you know, they knew right away, oh, this kid's something different, right? Something different about this kid. Um, he was actually named, his name was not originally Moshe. His name was um, Tuvia, which is good. Anyways, so eventually Yocheved can't have the baby anymore after three months are up. She knows the Egyptian spies know, hey, this woman's supposed to have the baby now. So she takes the wicker basket, she caulks the inside with clay, and the outside is lined with pitch. She purposely didn't put any pitch inside so that it shouldn't be a bad smell for the baby. Okay, and then she brings it to the river. She knows that, to the Nile, she knows that if I bring the basket to the river, the astrologer are going to get the sense like, oh, the Redeemer has been destroyed by water, everything's okay, you know, and they'll stop the witch hunt, basically for the baby boys, which is what happened. Even though obviously, there wasn't, there wasn't the way, the Redeemer was not punished by what destroyed by the water at this point, but that's, that's what they got a sense for. So Miriam stationed herself to watch the baby, right, when it's through the reeds. Now, at this time, we have Pharaoh's daughter, so... It writes her name is we call her Batya, but it writes her name actually is Bitya. It didn't say it specifically, but but the commentator call her Bitya. So she at that point she was out to immerse in the Nile River. And so why was that? Because she was in renouncing idolatry, right? Because they saw the, the river as as a god. So this was part of her like process of saying, like, I no longer believe in this river as being a god and whatever. Now the basket comes down, right, and she sees it and she tries to stretch out to get it and her hand miraculously elongates and she brings in the basket and she sees the baby starts crying she says oh this this is probably a hebrew child right etc etc she tries to bring a wet nurse for him an egyptian wet nurse and he won't um Moshe won't won't feed he won't nurse and because even at that point you know this kid was geared for speaking with god so even at that point he was already like he wasn't going to be uh he wasn't, he wasn't going to go there, I guess you could say. So finally, Miriam steps forward and says, oh, I have a Hebrew um, wet nurse that I can bring for you. So she obviously, who does she bring forward is Yocheved. And there's different commentaries about this. So some say that um, Yocheved kept him for two years, you know, just how long he would nurse for. Some say it was until 12. So he actually grew up among his people. Um, but either way, he was among his people um, for the first few years of his life. 
and then he had to, you know, then he had to be brought back to the palace. And that's when Beit Yabaya says, okay, I'm going to name you Moses, right? Moshe, from because I drew you out of the water. That's where the name comes from. Now, Moshe is living in Pharaoh's household. He gets elevated to kind of be the overseer of the household. When he's about 18, he goes out among the people and he sees an, Egy- an Egyptian taskmaster, ma- taskmaster striking a Jewish person. It seemed like something that was, that he was, he was really had it out for him. The commentators tell us that the person that he was beating was the husband of a woman named Shlomit Bastivri. This is a very, very unique situation. And we have her name, we have who she is kind of, because she was like the only one that this occurred with. That the taskmaster master would wake the Jew up early in the morning, get him out of the house, then he would go into the house, pretend to be her husband, and, um, and basically get into bed with her. So the reason why it's unique is it said otherwise the Jewish people kept to their own. Right, they didn't they didn't mix like that with, with the Egyptians, and the Egyptians didn't mix with the Jews like that. Anyway, so he's beating him, beating him, because once the Jew caught on to what was going on, so you know the Egyptian had out for it. So Moshe looks both ways. Basically it also says he kind of looked into the future to see, like, okay, is there gonna be anybody worth it coming from this guy? He sees that no, and then he he says God's name and he kills him and he buries him in the sand. Um now, the thing is that there were two Jews who did see him. Their names are Dustin and Aviram, and they are troublemakers that come up a lot. Um, anyways, the next day he comes out, and he sees them arguing with each other, and one of them raises their hand to hit the other. So he says to them, Tim, Russia, like a wicked person, why are you raising your hand to hit? And he called the person a wicked person even before he actually hit him, to show that the commentators say, because you know anyone who raises their hand to foul Jew to somebody else, that he's already a wicked person, but it's also partly because hands are supposed to be used for, for giving, for Torah and mitzvahs, for doing good stuff. And here he was kind of like perverting the use of hands, using it for something negative to strike against someone. So just that, just that taking, using a hand for something so so wrongly, that already he was called a wicked person. So Dustin and Avram turn on Moses like, hey, who put you in charge of everybody? What, are you gonna kill us also, right? And Moshe got scared, then he said, oh no, it's not what I was done, I got better run away. Now commentators say that, um, Pharaoh found out before he ran away and Pharaoh actually tried to have him killed and then it didn't work and Moshe just ran out. Now, when they do the math, figuring things out, it seems that there's a gap in years between when Moshe ran away to when he shows up again in Midian and he marries Sephora. So what's explained is that he actually ran away to what's modern day Ethiopia, which if you look on a map, it's like right there by Egypt. And they say he joined the army for like nine years and he was eventually crowned king. And he was a king for 40 years, okay? And then when he was um, when he was 67, about, he went to Midian. He's like, oh, it's time to get married. <laughs> so he goes to Midian and he sat down in a well because wells are the places where all of his ancestors found their, uh, found their futures there. So it's just an interesting uh, little insert over there. Now, he sits at the well and who, does he, who comes to the well? So you have Yisro, right, who at that time, by then, had after he had fled from Pharaoh's court, he was he was a big priest in Midian, a big, and then he renounced all idolatry. And because of that, the kind of the people ostracized him. They ostracized him. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. He had no sons. He had only daughters. So his daughters looked after his flock of sheep. So they came to the well to water the sheep, and the shepherds start harassing them. They chased them away. Whatever. So Moshe comes in. He interferes. And he makes sure that that the flocks are are watered. And they go home and Yisra's like, hey, how come you guys came home so early today? Like, what happened? Like, oh, there was, a, there was an Egyptian man who stepped in, da da da, whatever. Yisra recognized that this, they described how the water had come up to him, right? Which is something that we see with Rivka happened. Oh, so he said, oh, he knew right away. Like, we're not talking about a regular Egyptian guy. We're talking, we're talking about someone here. How come you didn't invite him in? Tell him to come in. <laughs> so, um, so he comes in and he starts working. He's going to become a shepherd for Yisro, and a few years later, now he's going to marry um, Tzipora, Tzipora, who's Yisro's daughter. And then their first son, their first son, Gershom, is born. Gershom, that I was a stranger um, in this land, um, was born. Now, back in Egypt, we're going, we're entering it now into phase, the next phase of the of the ex, of the exile, of the slavery. It says then that Pharaoh died, and there's, did the Pharaoh actually die? Or they say that he actually contracted leprosy, which is kind of like being dead. And in order to alleviate his leprosy, he used to bathe in the blood of, of the Jewish babies, which is obviously horrific. So 
that's that's not on the specific after the, in the text it tells us that the Jewish people then cried out to God and they cried out from the, from you know from the work basically they cried out from this terrible thing that was going on and right God heard and remembered so now we go back to Moshe Moshe is a shepherd okay and we have this one situation where he would take his he would take his flock way out into the desert to graze because to make sure they didn't eat anybody else's land from anybody else's land one time a little kid goes a little kid goat goes scampering off and he runs after him and the kid was just went to go drink and he said oh I didn't realize you were so thirsty you must be so tired now and he carried him back to the flock and God sees and says you are you are definitely worthy of being the shepherd of my flock now one day he's out he's out with the sheep and all of a sudden they say that he was near it says Mount Horeb which is say was actually Harsinai because the, the references that come in the text now seem to indicate that this is Harsinai so he's he's out in the desert now right and all of a sudden an angel appears to him in the burning bush right here comes the burning bush why is it a burning bush because a burning the, the bush it was this like prickly thorny bush which is considered this like lowly kind of plant and God is saying like I'm with you in in your in your sorrows and in everything that's going on now he turns to look God calls to him he says you know take off your shoes says I'm God um basically go to Pharaoh tell him to let the people go so that they can serve me etc 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 I'm not gonna totally recap the whole conversation but you know there's a whole thing that's going on here now um now Moshe protests well the people are gonna why would the people listen to me they're not gonna listen to me which God wasn't overly impressed he said how come you know why are you talking bad about my people so he says, okay, I'm going to give you signs. What's the first sign? He says, what's in your hand? This is a staff. Commentators say he said that because like, you deserve to be hit with the staff for speaking bad about my people. But so he's like, okay, take the staff and throw it down. So he throws it down, it turns into a snake. Okay, grab it by its tail, and now it becomes a staff again, right? So that's your first sign. Second sign, he says, put your hand into, um, kind of like into like where your, where your chest is, like into your you know, it's your coat over there. So he puts it in, takes it out, and it's all white with leprosy, which is a punishment of speaking lush and horror, speaking Eve slander against somebody else. Right? And then put your hand back in and went away to so that sign number two. Right? Both of these, because he's kind of telling them off, telling them off, or saying, oh, the Jewish people won't believe me. They won't believe, you know, it's time to be redeemed. And they said, if they still don't believe you, have a third sign, you could take a cup of water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground, it's going to turn into blood. That would be your third sign if you need it. Now, still, even with that, Moshe did not want to go. He said, send Aaron, I don't want to go. You know, I'm, I stutter, I'm, I'm, I, I don't speak well. It took him a week, a week of, of him standing, arguing at the burning, burning bush, before God is finally like, enough already, you're going, right? He also wanted God to just send Mashiach already. He said, why are you going to send me? And it's not going to be a full redemption because, you know, this is not going to be a permanent redemption. So, you know, let's not do a half job here. Send Mashiach and it will be a full job, right? Everybody will be a permanent redemption. Anyways, God finally said, okay, enough of all this, uh, you're going. Um, go go tell Pharaoh to send out my people so that they may serve me, right? Which you gotta remember to finish the sentence. Oh, let my people go, let my people, let my people go so they may serve me. Um, finally says, okay, fine. He goes to, to his father-in-law, goes to Yisra and says, okay, we gotta go. He packs up his wife, his son Gershom, his son, Eliezer had been born, but he didn't have a bris yet. And he said, oh, we got a trial now. We can't do the bris, whatever. But Moshe ended up getting a little bit in trouble from that because at the, he should have given his son the bris at the first available opportunity. You know, as soon as they came, they were close enough. They had rested enough. And he didn't do that. So God started to punish. There was a snake that came and started swallowing him up. And Sapporo did the bris and saved him, basically. So there were really a lot of Jewish women who, who saved Moshe. Or a lot of women who saved Moshe. Um... Now at that point, uh, um, Hashem told Aaron, hey, Moshe, Moshe is coming, you know, go out to him. So they go to meet him in the desert, and oh, hey, how you doing great? And then, hey, why, why are you bringing your wife and kids here? We have enough slaves, slaves in Egypt, you know, send him, send him back to, the, to her father and let, him, let them be saved there. So he does. Then they come back and they assemble all the people, and they're like, this is it, this is, you know, this is it. Um, if you remember um, the words that Yaakov had said, the Pakod Yifka, that God was going to redeem you. He had the magic words of redemption. Um, he showed them the sign and all that kind of stuff. Now we finally get to the end of the Torah portion. Moshe and Aaron went to Pharaoh. Now the elders, the king and the elders of the people were supposed to go with them. But as they got closer and closer to Pharaoh, they, they fell off, kind of chickened out, which Later on, that was part of why when the Torah was given, they weren't allowed too close up on the mountain for that. But anyways, so he goes to Pharaoh and he says, okay, let my people go, send out my people so they can have a holiday for me. And God said, and 
Farrah says, who's this God? I've never heard of him. Basically, it wasn't it wasn't a total denial of God that was going on, because obviously we see from earlier with the whole thing with the water and the flood and all that kind of stuff, it's not that Farrah was in total denial of God. Part of the denial was, was of God's um, intimate relationship with the universe, that the fact that God is always present in the world, and that God was not just, hadn't just created nature and then left it, that God was still involved in nature, that God could be beyond nature. It was the... Uh, it was the extent of God, I guess you could say. It was more than just, oh, this is a God, you know, that, that Pharaoh was denying. And they said, and then he said, no, I'm not going to let you out. And he says, come on, we're going to go, we're going to take a three-day journey and offer our sacrifices to God, right? Not saying whether or not that in return, we're going to go. So Pharaoh's like, enough of this. You're just being lazy and you're just here, you're trying to distract me. Get back to work and get tell everybody to get back to work and enough of this. And he says, that's it. All you lazy people from now on, he tells the overseers, don't give them straw for their, for their bricks anymore. Make them gather their own straw for their bricks and they still have to meet quota. So that they're going to stop with all this nonsense, you know? So the Egyptian task mas- taskmasters took that very well. They're very happy to beat any Jew who couldn't meet the quota. But yet the Israeli, for- the, the, not the Israeli, the Jewish foremen who were kind of like, okay, I think we're taking this a little bit uh, too far. And they were like, okay, be quiet, you know, be quiet, all of you. And they even... They said that even to the point that they would take, if they couldn't fill the quota of the bricks to put in, they would take the babies and stick them into the walls. And Moshe also turned to God as like, he complained about all this. There was one baby, God let him save one baby who grew up in Micha. He grew up, he ended up being one of the main people behind the whole sin of the golden calf. So God basically told, was basically trying to show that like, you know, there's a plan for everything, and there was a reason why it was these babies, not other babies. It make a so terrible situation, but now yeah, the people complaining that Moses made it worse, specifically Dustin and Aviram, those troublemakers from before. You made it worse. Moses turns to God and he says, "Why? Why did you send me if it only made it worse for your people?" And God says, "Okay, yeah. See, just you wait and see what's gonna happen. Not all Pharaoh's not just gonna send you out; he's gonna force you guys out. Just you wait and see." Which is what we find out, which is what will happen, the showdown to continue in the next Torah portion.